Thank you for joining us today. I'm Allison Skaberg here, Consolidated Planning Group. We are happy to be back with Shamika Allen today. We're going to be talking about uh, your vision for the future and how it drives the IEP and the art of parent input. This is such a timely topic uh, since um, kids are going back to school. And I know that education and the best education for our kids is um, near and dear to um, all parents' hearts. It's always something that's um, top of mind when it comes to planning for our loved ones. So um, I'm just going to go through a quick uh, few housekeeping items. If you are new to us today, Today, you're joining our webinar for the very first time welcome we're so glad you're here if you've attended in the past we're certainly glad that you've come back to join us consolidate a planning group is a holistic special needs financial planning firm we're nationally certified as Social Security Advisors and members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. Uh, we do a lot of advocacy by way of our webinars. We have a Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel. You can look for this little flower on the screen where you can subscribe to for free. There are hundreds of webinars on uh, that YouTube channel on planning and navigating um, you know, uh, things for your loved one with a disability. So if you can think of it, it's probably out there. There's over 400 topics out there. And so the thing is, is when we're planning for a loved one with a disability, there's all these things that we have to do, these hoops and loops that we have to jump through, you know, cross the T's, dot the I's, say this, don't say this, have this money in this bucket, don't do that. Um, and it's, often pretty overwhelming. So a lot of our webinars were designed with you in mind. I myself am a parent, with myself in mind of how difficult everything is. So we do hope that you'll check that out. Um, today we are in webinar mode, which means that we can't see you or hear you, but we know you're there. We're glad you're here. We'll hope, we hope that you will uh, put your questions in the chat box. If you are listening to this presentation uh, via podcast, you can reach out to us directly at contact at cpgcares.net. That's contact at cpgcares.net and we would be happy to provide you a copy um, of today's slides. So everyone who is registered is going to get an email with, uh, with an attachment of today's slides as well as a link to the recording if you need to go back and listen to anything. But I always just like to mention that from a perspective of taking notes. So um, having said that, I'm, I'm going to um, turn everything over to you, uh, Shamika, so we can get started on uh, the art of parent input. Thank you again for being here with us. Thank you, Allison. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. I would like to say a big welcome start to the school year. This is my first uh, speaking engagement for the 2024-25 school year. Just a little about me. Uh, next slide. I am the owner of Personalized Learning Solutions, special education advocacy and a consulting firm. I have over 15 years experience in teaching and administration in many districts in the North Texas area. In addition to my daily work as advocacy, I'm also on the education staff with COPA, which is the Council of Parent and Attorney Advocates. I teach uh, in their SEAT classes, which is special education advocacy training classes and the business of special education advocacy. Uh, I have been to thousands of ARDS, IEP meetings, 504 plan meetings, and student support team meetings. And lastly, I served on the Continuing Advisory Committee for Special Education from 2017 to 2022. So I just want to say thank you all for coming, and that's a little bit uh, about myself. Today's presentation objectives. Uh, you got to, yeah, thank you. We will go over the importance of a vision and parent input statement, how to develop an effective vision and parent input statement, which will help you have meaningful parent participation. And then when you are do, uh, collecting data, what are easy data collection techniques for uh, parents? We ask the school to have data. So when you're going into these, your ARD meetings and your IEP meetings, you also want to have data. So I'm going to talk to you about eight easy data collection techniques for parents. Next slide. So let's talk about the importance of a vision and parent input statement. So many times, in uh, especially here in Texas, uh, in ARD meetings, uh, they will do introductions and they ask you, well, what are your parent concerns? Well, a vision and parent input statement should just be more than your concerns. Remember, this is supposed to be a collaborative process. 
So I feel that when you just say your parent concerns, it's kind of like you're fussing about what did not happen. And you don't want to open the meeting with the art meeting with what went wrong and what's fussing. We want to keep the focus on the child and a, a collaborative environment. So that's the reason I like to say vision and parent input statement. We're going to talk about your concerns in the vision and parent input statement, but the team is going to learn a lot more about your child than just your concerns. So a vision and parent input statement is a visual picture that describes your child. Once you have read and shared your vision and parent input statement, the rest of the IEP team should have a better view of your child. They may find out something about your child that they did not know. And uh, the Individual with Disabilities Education Act has said that Congress found the education of children with disabilities can be made more effective by strengthening the role and responsibility of parents and ensure that families have meaningful opportunities to participate in, in the education of their child. We want you to have more than just passive uh, participation when you go to ARD meetings. We want you to be able to actively participate, and which is more than just listening. We want you to be able to share your thoughts and be able to ask questions. I just want to pause for a minute because I know you eat, sleep, and breathe this, and IEP and 504s and ARD okay. meetings and all this stuff. There's a lot of um, a lot of acronym, acronyms, and for, yeah, in case we may have a mom on here that's got a kid going to kindergarten with a disability, can, can we just, just talk at a high level of, of their rights to get um, a fair and appropriate education for their loved one with a disability? Okay, so ARD uh, meeting stands for Admission Review and Dismissal Meetings. That's what here in Texas we call, whereas the state calls IEP meetings, which is Individualized Education Program. Um, when you are first and you suspect your child has a disability, you want to uh, put in a request. You want to put it in writing. It can be via email to your child's teacher requesting a special education evaluation. Schools under the Independent Individual Disabilities Education Act have a right, have a duty to uh, locate and evaluate every student of a suspected disability. So that's called the Child Find Statute of IDEA, like I said, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So if your child is just starting school and you feel that they are uh, having some difficulties or you suspect they have a disability, all you have to do is put it in writing. I would do that via email and send it to your child's teacher and to the administrator uh, of the school. And that will start the special ed process and the evaluation process. And you stress this, um, and I think it's very, very important, is in writing. This is not catching the teacher on the playground or no. in the bus line or something like that. This is not that, it's not even a parent-teacher conference. It's in writing. If it's not in writing, it didn't happen. It really needs to be in in writing. Um, and some people say, well, I just don't want it to be so official or, you know, it, that it is the process and so you do want to do it that way. And that is very, very important. And then the other thing that I want to stress, because I had struggling learners um, and, you know, kind of went through some of these processes as well, is um, ask early, get involved early, mm -hmm. get this process started early. You don't have to wait for the whole first year of school to go or the whole next year of school to go to find out what they're not doing or what they, you know, how far behind they are. Um, I, I think it's it's easier to start early and then get to a point where maybe you don't need as much services as that you once did, as opposed to your four or five years down the road behind mm -hmm. and, and really feeling like you're drowning to be able to catch up. Allison, great point. And the reason why I say put this in writing is it starts an evaluation timeline and you want to make sure that you or the school is adhering to the timeline and you're keeping up to the timeline. So if you just hand it to the teacher, a note to the teacher or passing by at pickup time, you may forget the day that you did that. So when you send it via email, that is timed and date stamped and you can keep up with the timeline. Here in Texas, we have what we call our uh, 15... 45, 30 day timeline. The school district has 15 days to respond, uh, 15 school days. Now remember school days to respond to your request for testing. Once you sign consent for testing, they have 45 calendar days to complete the te testing. Yes. No, no, I'm sorry, 45 school days to complete the testing and then 30 calendar days to have the ARD meeting. So you want to keep up with those dates. 
So certain things are divided into school days and calendar days. If you, in the, When you're reading the law and learning about the law, if it doesn't specify school or, ca or calendar days, then it is calendar days. So we call it 15, 45, 30 timeline. 15 school days to respond, uh, 45 school days to complete that evaluation, That's and then 30 days to have the initial ARD IEP meeting. And so, that is why when we start counting all these days, it starts adding up quick. And, you know, that's why you want to get started early, because honestly, you could get started when school starts and it's about to let out for Christmas break by the time all this stuff starts moving. And then they're about to let out in the spring. Like, so that's why it's so important to get those things moving. So thank you for giving us those timelines. And before you move on. Um, you know, Shamika is an advocate. So the thing is, is some people feel pretty overwhelmed when you start like, oh, it's the IDEA law, yeah. it's all this stuff and these numbers and school days and business day, whatever, the, you know, they want to talk about. Um, and it starts feeling overwhelming. And, you know, if you're just a mom and you just want your kid to do well in school and you want them to have the tools and resources that they need and you don't want to be a specialist about the laws and how to proceed and things like that, that I am a fan of hiring an advocate because the advocates really know these things backwards and forwards. So it is something that you can definitely do outside. You can have an IEP, you can have your ARD meeting, you can have a 504 in place without hiring an advocate. But if if you want an advocate on your side that knows kind of the law and kind of the ropes, I, I am a fan of that for sure. Thank you, Allison, because, oh, go back. I haven't done that one. Oh. Back. Advocates are not always about contentious. Uh, a lot of my clients, I'm teaching the special ed process. So it's not, you know, not always about bringing an advocate in when you have trouble. So let's get back to the importance of a vision statement. The IDEA encourages a collaborative process between parents and, and, and districts. Remember, you are a mandatory uh, member of the IEP committee. And then it says specifically, Parents are free to provide parent input. After laws are passed, there's a commentary to the laws. It's called the commentary for federal regulations. So the law is what should be done, and the federal regulation kind of tells how it's being done and gives some feedback. So in the commentary for federal regulations, uh, after IDEA was passed, uh, it says parents can give uh, provide uh, sorry provide written input into their child's IEP. But one thing, it does not have to happen. You do not have to provide that written input ahead of the IEP meeting, but you legally can add, you can legally provide parent input into your child's IEP. And I ask for these vision and parent input statements to be copied word for word and inserted into the present levels. Just like the speech therapist inputs information, the classroom teacher, your information needs to be in the present levels. Uh, next slide. More on the parents' uh, importance of the vision and parent input statement. This is from the very beginning of IDEA. Parent participation is one of the core tenets of IDEA. That's why you get the notice. That's why you have to sign consent for testing. That's why you have to sign consent for the first provision of services. Congress understood that parents, you have every right to advocate for your child. And then in 2017, there was an Andrew F. Court decision that reiterated. We already know parents are part of the IEP team. We already know you are very important. You are the expert on your child. But Chief Justice Roberts reiterated the importance of parent participation. It says IDA requires IEPs to develop with the expertise from schools and input from parents. So one way for you to do this effectively is to develop an effective vision and parent input statement. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what goes into that vision and parent input statement. Remember, it's important to share your insights on your child instead of just talking at the meeting. You, these meetings can get very emotional. And uh, so you want to make sure you stay focused. You want to keep your needs of your child on focus, on focus. So doing it in writing is the best. And this is just a report. It's not an official document. It doesn't need to be notarized. There's no right or wrong way to do a vision and parent input statement. You know, Shamika, I think some parents have it in their mind that all these meetings go bad and it's a terrible adversarial meeting. And I don't think that's always the case. I mean, there are some cases that, you know, are crazy, but, you know, it's not always the case. And you don't have to have it in your mind that or be loaded for bear that this is going to be a fight. I'm going in to fight. 
because it's not always like that. Um, can can you talk a little bit about that as well? Sorry about that. Well, well no problem. That's the reason why I said um, when the meeting, normally in Texas, when the meeting starts, they do introductions. They ask, what are your parent concerns? To me, that's starting the meeting off on a negative tone. So even if you weren't coming with a contentious meeting, if you start things off, I feel with concerns and you may be pointing out something that didn't happen or a particular teacher did, then it kind of puts the rest of the committee on the defense. So if we start with a positive talking about something about your child, what you hope to see for the future. And you'll see as we go down through this, the very end part of vision and parent input statement is your parent concerns. But we've told uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things about your child, the things they're interested in, their likes, dislikes. And then what do you want to see in the IEP and what is your vision for your future for your child? And then you're going to let them know, hey, these are my concerns. Things need to be addressed. And so then we, we are starting off with a collaborative process, with a collaborative attitude instead of just what are your concerns? So IEP meetings do not always have to be uh, contentious. Remember, the purpose of IDEA is to uh, prepare children for life after high school, whether it's employment, dealing in employment, post-secondary education, independent living, access and community resources. So when meetings, I tell you, when meetings are contentious, you just need to stop and take a break, take a breather. Everybody needs to recollect their thoughts. And remember, the focus is on the child. I know since COVID, a lot of focus has been on school resources. In your vision and parent input statement, you don't want to get into a school versus your, you battle for resources. You get what your child needs in the IEP, and then the school is responsible for implementing that IEP, whether they have to hire people or contract outside of the district for people. But that's one thing I'm going to talk about when we talk about the specifics of what goes into the vision statement. You don't want to talk about resources, district resources. And I know that has been a battle since COVID, especially with a lot of the lack of resources with teachers and especially related services. The so bottom line is, is anybody who feels attacked that it starts being adversarial is basically how it goes. And I think about like in a conversation of, you know, hey, the following things are going right. Like these are the things that I'm feeling pretty happy about. These are the things I think we can turn the knobs on or something like that. There's just a way to communicate it more effectively. Mm -hmm. So that way it is not a fight as opposed to a conversation um, for the best interest of the child. Oops. Oh, go, go back. Wait, I'm sorry. One extra click there. There you go. Yeah, go, go back one more. There you go. So what is in this vision and parent input statement? Remember, it's not an official document. It is a document that you prepare ahead of time. Now I say this, you don't wanna be doing it the morning of your ARD meeting or an hour before. You wanna take some time to think about this and prepare this document. Remember, you wanna be concise, you wanna be thorough. Child focus, we're not pointing out faults of the school district. So if you feel, feel particular pieces of your child's IEP were not implemented, you don't wanna say this teacher did not do this. You wanna say, well, I feel my child's accommodations were not followed. I feel this goal was not effectively worked on. You don't wanna do individual attacks of staffs. And the reason why I love vision and parent input statements, just like Consolidated Planning Group is a holistic company when it comes to working with families of children with special needs, the vision and parent input statement gives a holistic picture of your child. And, and you're gonna, uh, once we finish talking about what goes in it, you'll see how that, when I say holistic picture, it's more than just their academics. It's about their vision, what you want, they wanna do in the future. It's about their likes, their dislikes. Um, I want you to see my, um, the light bulb on the screen. Oh, I made this um, with a, a program online and I felt I want to put some key words for everyone to remember. So we have IDEA, which is the law. You want to make your vision and parent input statement child focused. You do want to focus on needs. You want to talk about solutions. It needs to be results oriented. You want it to be concise. It's your vision and you want to talk about your student's strengths. So with those words, let's talk about what's included. You can talk about strengths, accomplishments, interests, things they do outside of school, extracurricular activities, what are areas of need, if strategies that are working and not working, if you have outside service providers, ask them to do a summary for you. You can include outside service provider information in your uh, vision and parent input statement, any behavior concerns you have. 
and any requests that you have. And remember that data, we're always asking the school district to bring us data. So parents, we're bringing data too. So you want your request and what data, summarize the data you have to support your request. For instance, if you're asking for an increase in a related service, you could talk about what uh, if you have an outside related service. Now, I know some related services are different, uh, like speech, clinical speech and uh, school based speech is different. But if the skills your child is working on, you could talk about these are the skills my child has worked on in speech and this is what they're doing and how they're accomplishing it. And we meet this many times a week. You can use that data if you to support your request for an increase in speech. So this is just next slide, please. All right, a little more in depth. That was just general. Now I wanna talk really in depth on what goes in a vision and parent input statement. Strength and weaknesses. You wanna start with that because remember, any a school district is responsible for developing goals and objectives for any identified weakness or deficit. And remember IEPs uh, help a child to work on more on academic, social, behavioral, functional deficits, just not uh, academic. So strength and weakness, how's your child doing? What are you observing at home and in the community? What are your concerns? What is working at home? What is working with your outside uh, service providers? What homework strategies are working? Technology strategies, what technology is working? Remember, assistive technology is a service in the IEP. What successes is your child having outside of school and their extracurricular activities? Uh, what does he or she find interesting outside of school? How does this uh, benefit them? How is it increasing their self-esteem? What are your child's hobbies? Behavior at home. Are, what, are you seeing uh, new behaviors at home? Are you seeing a decrease in behaviors? Uh, all, any behavior concerns you have? Next slide. Now, what is your child saying about school? If your child's able to tell you this, what are their favorite subjects? Who are their favorite teachers? What brings them success? What brings them failure at school? Uh, do you hear self-confidence or frustration? Next, life after high school. Remember, the core purpose of IDEA is to prepare students for life after high school, where they're going to be employed, post-secondary education, independent living, uh, accessing resources. So you want to talk about what are your child's interests. So for example, uh, every school district now has career and technology classes, career paths. So for instance, if your child likes working with animals, or if your child likes helping others, there's career tracks for those and your child could take classes when they get into high school in that career track. Well, yes, your child might not finish that career track, but they are taking classes in their interest. That's the reason you want to let a district know and an IEP team know your child's interest is there are all kinds of career and technology tracks. Uh, and you do, that's why our career and technology representative is every at every IEP meeting, when your child turns 14 in the state of Texas, you start talking about transition and you have a rep from the career and technology department to discuss those programs. So you wanna tell your child's interest because there may be a program where they could take a couple of classes. And then what do you think of your latest IEP? Did it work well? What worked for your child? What didn't? What goals were approved? What were not, uh, I mean, achieved? What were not achieved? And then any other concerns? So as you can see from the beginning of the presentation, when I talked about, we're not gonna start with concerns. We're gonna tell all this helpful and glorious information about your child. And then we're gonna talk about concerns because we're gonna, then at that time we're moving into developing the IEP and you want them to know what are your concerns so it can be addressed. Next slide. So what are some phrases we can use? You want to remember you want this to be strength based. You want it to be positive. One more click. Good. Thank you, Allison. You want to talk about obtain things like obtaining meaningful employment, volunteering at school, increasing social activities, developing friendships if they're interested in post-secondary education. Now, remember I told you we talked about data and providing this data. You can track skills that your child has learned. Every, all of us have these phones, they're great. You can open up a notes in your phone, whether you use 
iPhone or Android, and you can make a list of what you're seeing your child doing. The general list of strength, skills, the, and, and then needs. You can keep that on your phone, and then you can incorporate in that into your vision and parent input statement. So on my screen, I have a little graphic on this slide. It says, what is a vision statement? It says, develop a vision statement to present at IEP meetings. When they ask you what are your concerns or, uh, or what would you like to talk about today, you want to read your statement. You also want to provide the committee with copies of your statement. And then you want to email that copy to, to the person that is uh, putting the IEP together, like I said, I, your statement needs to be included in the present levels of the IEP. You are an important member, just like the PT, the OT, the classroom teacher giving their input, your input goes and don't let them summarize it, have them copy it word for word. That's the reason you want it uh, to email it to them. ahead. You can, you can do it ahead of time if you like, but you're not required. Remember, it's a prepared statement that highlights what your child's going to be doing. It can be in the next one to five years. It could be in the next six months. It could just be the semester of school. You want to talk about strength, interests, concerns. Main thing is keep the focus on your child. We're not talking about school district personnel. We're not getting into battle of, about resources. And remember, the IEP is focused on the future. So you want to talk about what you want to see your child doing in the future. It doesn't have to be life after high school. It could be until the end of the school year. It could be if you're in uh, seventh grade, you could talk about by the end of middle school. So remember, there's no right or wrong way to do these vision and parent input statements. So when it comes to transition planning, I know the state of Texas, it starts at age 14 and other states are different. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we do have people that attend from out of state, but Texas is age 14. Do you have any recommendations at what grade level maybe a parent should start thinking about transition planning? Uh, maybe not pulling the trigger, but starting, you know, kind of starting the vision and thinking about this? Transition planning the skills start as early as elementary school. TEA put out a great employability and I think it's transition handbook. And it has at the very back of that transition skills that should be going on at every grade uh, level. So transition starts at every grade level. If you give me a second, I can tell the name of the book, uh, but it has it at the back of it. It has next steps and it's divided up by like elementary school, middle school, high school. So you can start thinking about transition at any grade. But if you're talking about age 14 and the transition plan, or we're talking about employment and post-secondary, um, I would say you want to start thinking about that really at the beginning of your the sixth grade year. Most uh, students start um, um, talking about transition in IEP at eighth grade year when they turn 14. So sixth grade year. But you can work on transition skills at any age. Time on task is a transition skill. And, you know, and transition is such a broad word as transition in medical, transition in education, trans transition to employment. So I see two secondary transition guidance um, on um, Texas.gov, secondary mm -hmm. transition guidance. And I see another one that is put out by TexasBedSupport.gov, um, and it's the Texas Transition and Employment Guide. Both of that, those are out, out there. That is that one, Texas Transition and Employment Guide. Let me check for sure. Give me two seconds and I can tell you because at the back of that one, it has the, it's called next steps. Uh, I'm looking, give me just a second. I'm looking in my transition uh, folder that I have. A and I just wanted to mention that Autism Speaks website, they have a lot of resources on there, whether your child has autism or not, it doesn't really matter. But they have a lot of guides and a lot of best practices out there for free on the Autism Speaks website. Um, they've had they have some good ones on transition. Okay, the document that we're referring to is called Pathways: The Texas Transition and Employment Guide to Successful Life After High School for Students with Disabilities. And like That's I said, a mouthful. can you say that one more time? Pathways. I'll put it in uh, the chat. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Let me let me get that in the chat and let me do one more thing. Students with disabilities. Let me do one more thing so I can key you in. Um, it starts on page. It's a great document all the way through, but I really like um, the pages. 
and call next steps. And it starts on page 37. And it goes through next steps, talking about transition, breaks it down early childhood, elementary, what you should be doing, can do in middle school, high school, and then after you child graduates. It's a great uh, document that was put out by TEA. And it can, just because you're not in our state of Texas, doesn't mean you can't utilize that document. I've seen uh, some from other states that were awesome too. I'm definitely seeing those. So we got a couple of questions, Shamika. Um, okay. When the R team insists that they will attach your parent input or put it in the notes, even when you request for it to be present levels, how do you respond to that? You do not move forward with the, with the meeting. If they say they cannot do it, uh, then you need they need to tell you in a prior written notice uh, why they cannot do that document. I need to summarize in that prior written notice document. A prior written notice document is a document that basically summarizes what has taken place during the IEP meeting before the IEP is implemented. So they have to give you a good reason why they cannot implement it. It doesn't need to be at the back of the IEP, it does not need to be an attachment. This is your child's present levels. And like I said, you are a required member of the IEP team, just like anyone else. And anyone that works with your child at the school can input into the present levels. They ask for information. So your information is just as important. So you don't, you do not uh, move on. If you get the copy of the IEP and it's not, uh, we're in the present levels, do not agree to the IEP. Do not sign it until they correct it. Okay, see, and that's good feedback because I think sometimes, you know, um, a lot of people going into these meetings, they feel pretty stressed about these things and then they feel waylaid, like they don't know how to respond. It just depends on you and your personality and if you're, if you're a little anxious on things and then they say something, you're like, and then you walk away and you say, I should have said or should have done. So that's good feedback. Um, so another question before we move on, focus on your child, but, re, um, but review what has worked, has worked. What is needed, our district refuses to include in the plan guidance as they had incorporated previously in our older child's IEP that helps the teacher know how to approach our student and support our student with big assignments. How do we discuss this um, with focus on the student without bringing up the issues with the district? And, you know, that brings up a valid point because, you know, we, we um, ha there's, and there's probably educators, I come from a long line of educators, by the way. Um, and so there's probably educators on here, uh, uh, today, and it's, it's not that they don't have the best interest in mind, but sometimes it is a matter of training or what the 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 support the training and the understanding with the that they're they're working with so can you talk about um you know working with the teacher for the best practices of implementation so this this question here kind of deals with an accommodation um so accommodation of breaking down uh assignments into smaller assignments um that is you know can be you talk about it in the vision statement as a need for your child um, instead of talking about this teacher didn't do this or teachers need to approach it this way. You talk about how the, your child needs to be approached. What is the best way for your child maybe to decrease their anxiety in handling large assignments? And then there needs to be an accommodation for breaking down large assignments, maybe with uh, due dates or something like that. So let's talk about the present levels. You hear me saying that this um, vision and parent input needs to be in the present levels. Yes, here in Texas, we call it present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. But being that I advocate in a couple of different states, I just say present levels. So the present levels is the star. You'll see the star on the screen. It is the star of the IEP. Once you do introductions and things like that in the meeting, the first piece of the IEP you discuss is the present levels. It is the starting point, it's the foundation. The IEP committee must determine a student's present levels before you can determine goals, accommodations, if there's any curricular modifications, and what is the best placement and offer of FAPE, which is free appropriate public education for the student. Um, click, can you click for me, Allison? Okay, the present level tells the story of your child. It comes from a variety of data sources, remember data. Present levels is the star of the IEP. Data is the foundation to the present levels. 
Uh, next, uh, click one more click. Okay, remember the present levels identifies the student's strengths. Remember, we want to have strength-based IEPs, not deficit-based IEPs, and it identifies the need. Data can come from teacher work samples, teacher observations, student attendance, performance on district exam, work samples, discipline data, and other areas, and your, your parent input. Next slide. Sorry about that. We have another question. Um, it is kind of long. Our district is constantly interjecting their opinion in our parental statement, disregarding our statements and or misrepresenting our statements. Um, student benefits from graphic organizers, but we ask the student and the student denied using them. Teacher agrees that the graphic organizers are not helpful for the student is an example. You do not. The district cannot. Um... Do not let them change your present levels, your input. You're not changing the OT's input. You're not changing the teacher's input. So again, you do not agree to sign that IEP and until that is corrected. And then if they continue to do that, they need to document in the prior written notice why they feel it is a good idea to change your, your, your uh, input. So we've talked about the present levels, the star. So that present level is built on data. So let's talk about the importance of data collection. Data collection is a systematic approach of measuring information. It comes from a variety of sources. It helps to give an accurate picture. As you can see from my favorite Disney movie, um, you have the IEP meeting and you have everybody around gathered. Then you have special education law as the as your back as your your foundation. And here is you holding up data or the school district holding up data. This is showing their Simba. He's the data. It shows how important data is to the development of the IEP. It is the foundation. It is the starting point. That's the reason why all goals need to have a benchmark. I mean, it needs to have a starting point, a present level. It is essential data, appropriate data collection, effective, timely data, data collection is essential for the success of your child's IEP on their goals and objectives. There can also be data collection on how they're doing in the general education curriculum. Meaningful data collection lets you know if your child is making progress toward their IEP goals. It is also one of the required components of IDEA. If you look in your IEP under each goal, it says how will data be collected when? Data is uh, is collected and progress reports are sent home uh, in concurrence with report cards. OK, so if your school uh, sends report cards every six weeks or every nine weeks, your child gets a report card that's reported on his progress in the general education curriculum. And then your IEP progress report, which should include data, is measuring how your child is doing on their IEP goals. OK, timely data tells the student is struggling to make changes. So an data example. is not the report card. So you're saying it's like once they have the goals, that's how they're progressing through yes. the goals is what actual data is. Yes, yeah, the data. Yes. And that Thank is you. put in the IEP report card, IEP progress report. And usually the IEP progress reports, they will mark something like a continuing, mastered. And then there, there usually is a space where they can put some data. So, for example, if a child is supposed to read 15 sight words. They can tell you the child is continuing on reading those sight words, and then they can give you an example of the sight words that they have read and how many. That's data, okay? Um, if your child's working on reading so many words per minute and fluency, that number, that data. Remember, on IEP goals, IEP goals include a time frame, like um, in next 30, uh, 36 instructional weeks, uh, when given, when a student is given like accommodations or those are things that are to help the child uh, achieve the goal, you have the behavior in the goal and you have the mastery criteria. So your IEP goal should have four parts, time frame, we call it conditions or what's given to assist the child, the behavior and skill being measured. Every IEP goal should have one skill. You do not have multiple skills in a goal and then the mastery criteria. So if the mastery criteria here in the goal is being measured in trials, percentages, your data given to you should be in the same, okay? It must match. That's very important. I, I find districts, and this is done all the time in districts, it will be in trials, and they will say 80% or what, you know, so it, apples to apples, okay? 
We have an awesome question in the chat box. Is and I, I don't know the answer to this. Is there a time frame for that present levels are no longer considered present? Example, school is utilizing data from an evaluation that's over a year old, but refuses to utilize our inputs as parents for increased abilities year to date. So let's talk about that. Well, first of all, an IEP evaluation of, of uh full individual evaluation, you get one every three years. So that evaluation data is, is going to get old, okay? And the present levels and IEPs uh, is from calendar year is a calendar year. So if your child's IEP uh, date, ARD meeting is 8-7-24, your next ARD date is 8-6-24. So the information in that IEP is the present levels. When you call, say that you have an annual meeting and then you need to call another meeting, that's a review meeting. You can add information to the present levels, but that existing information still stays there because an IEP covers a calendar year. And if they, if they at any time during a review meeting, you can add to the present level. So you can do a new vision and parent input statement and have that added to the present levels, but that existing data will stay there. And as far as the evaluation data, this example being used, evaluations are done every three years unless you request for a new evaluation to be done because you need a new area evaluated. One person asked um, about an asthma question where the kid is on an inhaler a couple times a day and there's a requirement um, for PE uh, to graduate. Is that a requirement that can be waived in, um, as it relates to a medical condition? Um, no, um, we, we have, um, in state of Texas, you have graduation requirements. And, oh, go back one. And uh, the, the PE is a graduation requirement. You, I'm not saying it can't be done. You talk to your art committee, but when you get to high school, you're working on credits to receive a high school diploma and PE is a graduation requirement. You may can see, can there be a class that can be substituted? So where can you collect that? Where's data collected and where can you as a parent collect data? Remember, you're, we're using data to support our requests. So teachers and school staff are collecting data in the classroom, playground, cafeteria, school hallways, and if they're in a vocational program, on a job site. You as a parent, you're collecting data in the community and home. So now we're going to talk about eight data collection techniques that I feel as a parent uh, were good for you to utilize. Uh, next slide. First is observations and anecdotal records. Those are different. An observation is the methodical and structured assessment. It has a beginning and end. Anecdotal records are just a description of what has happened for the day. It's like a transcript of the event series. It doesn't necessarily have a beginning or end time. You can develop a portfolio of your child's work. If they have a tutor, uh, you can collect work samples. Your portfolio can be uh, content specific. It can be a reading portfolio, math portfolio, or it can just be a collection of all their work. And in that portfolio is work samples. A work sample shows the skill level of a child is a concrete demonstration of what they can do. Then you have a checklist. Say your child is learning to do uh, use the functional skill of using the microwave and you've broken down that skill into steps. You can use a checklist to see where they are at that skill, what steps they have done, what they have learned and what they uh, still need to learn. Next slide. We all have our lovely phones taking pictures. Audio and video recording. Say you want to record your child completing a task. You can record them completing a math problem. Uh, if they're working on reading fluency, reading, these can be all be shared with the IEP committees. I have a client who sh we shared a bunch of videos of her son's outside occupational therapy working. So this is uh, with, with her son. All of those can be shared. What teachers usually use are data collection sheets. Um, you can do, you can make a data collection sheet. Um, I have samples where you doing your own progress on the goals. They're strictly data collection sheets. And then there are also electronic apps. 
uh, that you can collect data. A lot of these apps are geared toward teachers, but like I said, find, if you find something that works for you, you can use electronic. Uh, the notes app in the iPhone is a scanner. If you're trying to make electronic, say work samples and worksheets electronically, and you can scan it that way to help build uh, your child's uh, portfolio. Uh, next slide. Um, I have another question. If if you are a kindergarten student who has only had um, diagnostic testing and no school experience, do they only use that limited data to determine placement, or how how do they figure that out? If you've only had you know testing but no school experience. Yes, that's the data. The, the IEP is based on data, so that's all the data that they have. So remember the present levels is based is based on data. And so the data from that evaluation, they can't say you have any classroom observations or interactions with the teachers because they're not in school. So the the more your child goes to school, the more data you will have and be able to and use that evaluation. If it was an outside evaluation, so let's say it was one of the children's hospitals that did the outside evaluation. Does the school have to take that or do, are they going to do their own testing, Shamika? Students, IDA for eligibility starts with an evaluation. Outside evaluations are basically considered independent education evaluations. By law, districts have to consider them, review them, but the IDA and the special ed process starts with the school district has to complete a full initial and individual evaluation. Perfect. And somebody put some stuff in the chat box about the gym, um, like the PE credit. And one of the things that I was thinking of is like some of the schools, you know, for a person, they may have like PT um, coming in. And I'm wondering, and this may be something where you have to, you know, contact the Department of Education at, at the state level to find out like if they're having like physical therapy or if there's a physical reason that they seriously can't do gym, there's got to be a workaround. Yeah, but I think that that's definitely going to be more at a state level. They're yes. not going to have a kid that's going to have a heart attack by doing gym, make them do Jim, yeah, I mean, so that's not, that's not going to happen. So, so it just it just has to be documented in the ARD that this is counting if it's a, if it's going to count as an exception for PE um, as a, an alternative. That just has to be documented. So my final thought is: remember, your parental input is vital to the development of your child's IEP in future. Uh, one more slide, Allison. Um, these are not included. Nope. Yes, these are not included, but I um, do have available on my website, uh, which Allison, if you could put that contact information again, available on my website, I have a vision and parent input statement template. Uh, no, sorry, let me go back. I'm sorry, I don't. That's an IEP at a glance document that I have for parents to make for the beginning of the school year. Um, these are some resources that I have. I have a vision and parent input statement template that I give to parents. Um, I have some sample vision and parent input statements. You can write it in bullets. You can write it in paragraphs. Um, I have data collection sheets that I have developed. And then during COVID, I don't think you could probably find this resource anymore. TEA developed some data collection sheets for different subjects. They are really good. I just went through and made them a little modified and made them a little more parent friendly. But TEA probably doesn't even know where this is anymore because it was they were developed during COVID for when parents were at home, you know, and there was kids were at home and collecting data. So I'm a big uh, believer in collecting resources. So I have these resources um, available. Um, if my contact information is there, if you would like these, um, if I get a lot of requests for them, um, I uh, may send it out as a big group. Uh, message, but if you want to, if you want to send them to us, um, okay. go ahead and send them to us. Then when we send out a link with the slide okay. and the recording, we'll just go ahead and attach them to that email, and it'll go out to everybody who registered for today's. Um, okay, today's I'll send video. them. Send them to Meredith. That's perfect. That okay, perfect. We'll, do that. we'll handle that. Um, we do have another question. Is the district required to do their own evaluation at the three year mark? Is it acceptable for the district to instead only use evaluations from the IEE requested the year prior? 
district by law has to, your child has to have a review of existing evaluation data or a new FIE every three years. That's a requirement of IDEA. IEEs are, like I said, independent evaluation and according by the law, they just have to consider them. That means for them to be reviewed at an IEP meeting, they do not have to accept any kind of uh, medical diagnosis. Remember, schools don't medically diagnose. They look at educational eligibility. They don't have to accept any accommodations or, 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 or um, suggestions for services. But you have you start the special ed process with an evaluation and you have a review of existing evaluation data or a new evaluation every three years. That is a requirement. That's good. And one thing um, that I wanted to mention, actually two things is one is if there's been a material change in your student, like like something else has happened, there's a new diagnosis, something else has happened and has changed drastically. How do we report that to get it like let's suggest that now mom um, suspects dyslexia, for instance. And that wasn't previously evaluated. How do I request further evaluation if if I suspect something new? You can request a new evaluation anytime. One area and it can be evaluated once per year. So if you've had an evaluation and you're it's two years old and you suspect your child has a uh, dyslexia. Um, you can put in a request for a new evaluation. If it's two years old, the district is going to probably go ahead and start planning for that reevaluation and include dyslexia testing. But you can request if something you feel has not been tested or you see a new a need, you can request testing at any time. And I just wanted to mention again, because again, depending, you know, we got people of all ages, you know, kids that are starting school, kids that are in high school. Um, but, but don't be afraid to reach out and ask for services. If you already know your kid is starting kindergarten, you already know that there's a struggle. I think sometimes parents don't want to ask for services because they don't want their kid to be in quote unquote special ed. But just because you you have, um, you know, you have accommodations in place does not mean that they're not in mainstream education. So no. don't think of the old school special ed like when you were a kid. It's not like that. And quite honestly, I know we're all proud parents and we want the best for our kids, um, but we are definitely doing a disservice to not get them the services that they need to be successful. I think of, and I think about this on higher education for kids with disabilities that are going to college. And I always mm -hmm. tell parents, help them get their, their accommodations. Mm -hmm. Don't let them start the semester with both hands behind their back. They've yes. got this far, they've got accepted to college and they can do it, but they do need their accommodations. So I, I, I think that it, is very very important and i just want to make it a new parent you got a kid starting kindergarten and they're not measuring up where the other kids are you feel overwhelmed i mean it's a lot mm -hmm. <laughs> so but but there is support out there for you and it doesn't mean that they're in a contained classroom or things like that it's not what that means anymore so here's my contact information as you can say as i put in the chat i also run a very Great, I love it. It's because I feel it's becoming one of the best Facebook groups uh, on Facebook. It's, it's strictly about the laws, IEPs, all of that. Oh, one more slide. And it's called uh, Special Education IEP and 504 Plan Support Group. And then just something funny, you know, if you wanna, you know, because some, sometimes special ed, you gotta have a laugh to get through this process. Um, I've collected over 60 red flag, ridiculous and red flag statements I have heard at IEP meetings and, and uh, colleagues. And it's an ebook on Amazon. I just, I mean, I think it's funny some of the ones you read and you, maybe some you have heard, but what I did distinctly in this book is I divided them up by categories. I just don't give you a list of 60. I divided them up like accommodations. This is some crazy things I've heard. Evaluations, some crazy things I've heard. And then the tip, the book also includes some tips, but they're, they're hilarious. Some are, 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 are hilarious. I've had people ask me if I'm going to write a part two and how you would respond. And I think that, you know, I'm thinking about it. It's just it would take so long to do to, to say, how would you respond to that? But um, this is my contact information. Um, you can join my Facebook group. Uh, I share a lot of helpful information. There's a detailed file section in my Facebook group of things you can download, helpful tools and resources. Um, and then that's all I have, Allison. 
So the Facebook group, Special Education IEP and 504 Plan Support Group. Yes, that's the name of it. Yes, ma'am. So IEP, I was just looking for it, IEP and 504 Plan, plan Support Group. It has a... a It has a picture of a, it says at the top, special education IEP, it says support with hands holding the word support. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. I suggest everybody join that. So awesome. Thank you. And the thing is, is um, Shamika, so if you are here and you need support, if you've run into some brick walls and you need help, um, people can hire you. Do you have a free consultation where they can yes. learn more about your services and kind of what you might be able to do for them? Yes, I, all of my uh, services include a free consultation, except for my Ask an Advocate consultation. If you go to my website under services, uh, you can see all the services that I offer. But if you need direct advocacy services or you need me to work with you, uh, I have uh, those come with uh, a consultation, a free consultation. And then new this year, I have my Ask an Advocate consultations where you can bring a copy. We'll go on Zoom, bring a copy of your IEP, 504 plan or evaluation. And I will go through it with you right then, and then I'll give you a report. That doesn't come with a free consultation because we're working right there with it. But if you're needing me to go to a meeting and help you get prepared, that comes with a free consultation. I think um, I just think that that the professional services. I'm a fan of sticking to what you know and being really good at what you're really good at. And if you're hearing like these numbers and the numbers of days and the law and in writing and you feel like, how do I keep that all straight? Then I think it's worth, um, you know, hiring an advocate and putting the money forth to hire an advocate. It's your child's education. So you want to get it right. You want to get it right early. And if you got it wrong early, it's OK. It's not about beating yourself up. You're here now. It's about picking up where you are and moving moving forward. It's not about looking back. It's about moving forward and getting them the, the services that they need going forward. Because you, you learn what you learn at the pace that you learn it. And so, you know, you may have not been able to, ready to receive information that you've received today. And so we're all we're glad you're here, whether you're pretty far along in your, you know, in your in your planning and, and your educational career of your student, or you're just beginning, um, there's always help out there for you. So feel encouraged with that. Allison, um, can I can I put, can I say one more thing? Sure. Uh, new this um I do a summer a parent advocate master class and it's a six week class. But I this start launched this week. I have launched the parent advocate master class ebook which is all of those presentations combined. It's 131 pages of everything special ed broken down into weeks. And then I give you access to the parent advocate uh, membership, masterclass membership folder that includes over 75 resources that you can utilize as you're advocating for your child. It um, is a great resource. Um, it will help you if you cannot afford direct advocacy services. I launched two new services this week, the Ask an Advocate consultation and uh, help you prepare for an IEP meeting and the Parent Advocate Masterclass ebook. Um, this is my curriculum that I've developed and put together for six weeks. I do this in the summer and it's six week live, six live classes and we have two more coming up, two Saturdays left, but I took what I've done for that class and combined it to where you can have resources for yourself. And then as you can see, I'm a big believer in resources and I have an extensive resource library and I'm giving you access to over 75 of those resources that you can utilize and keep as you go through the special ed process through the years for your child. I love that. I love that. Well, Shamika and I both are wishing you a ha happy and successful school year. I know everybody's getting ready and getting geared up for that. Um, but mamas and dads, you've got this. It's going to be a good year and they've mm -hmm. got you on their side. So that is definitely wonderful. Shamika's um, been wonderful uh, partnering with you again. Uh, to you. learn about this and, and all of the resources that you talked about that you put in the chat box are um, definitely exciting. There may have been some questions that we didn't get to. Shamika, we'll, we'll send you an email, the, the yeah. chat box and the questions so you can reach out to anybody that maybe we weren't able to answer today. Um, Consolidated Planning Group, we always offer free personalized consultations. This QR code that um, is on the screen will take you to our calendar um, where um, we can kind of learn a little bit more about the planning that you've done so far. 
um, and kind of go over any questions that you have. Check out our YouTube channel. Um, everybody's going to get a copy of uh, today's slides as well as a link to the recording. Um, in the slides, I'll have a link to our upcoming webinars uh, that we have coming up over the next couple of months as well. So thanks so much, everyone. It's certainly been my pleasure, and we look forward to chatting with you again, Shamika. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now.